All right. So um, this this uh, webinar, what I want to do is essentially go over preventative herd health. We're going to concentrate on parasites because since that's the major issue that affects our small ruminants. Um, and, you know, if we can and, and really talk about mineral, because uh, I really strongly feel like if your copper and selenium are out of whack, if you've got deficiencies, then your parasite issue will be much worse. So, um, so we're going to talk about that as well. And, uh, but, but to start off the talk, the one thing that is very, very important is you have to know what normal is to know what abnormal is. Um, anytime you have an animal that passes away on the farm and, you know, and you go on, you know, scratching your head, but you don't want to spend $150 to have a necropsy, go ahead and open them up. Um, chances are you probably won't know what's going on, but as you look at more and more of them, um, it really does teach you uh, what normal versus abnormal is. Um, a, a normal, healthy animal will be just like this kid in the picture, you know, running and jumping and playing. Their appetite's good. I always recommend feeding a little bit of grain. A lot of people don't want to, you know, for some reason in the summertime, don't want to feed grain. But how are you going to know if an animal is sick um, out on a pasture? Um, generally, they'll be isolated off by themselves. But if you feed them every day, even if you only feed them a cupful, um, if you feed them every day, they'll come up to the bunk. And those that don't, maybe something's wrong with them. Water consumption's kind of difficult in the summertime if they're drinking out of a creek or something like that. Um, automatic water's hard to evaluate, but um, you know, trust me, if you if their water is not working, they'll let you know. May the biggest thing about water it is it, it needs to be clean. If you feel feed uh, water out of a water trough, you've got to make sure that that water is changed daily. Um, or at least cleaned um, every other day. Goats and sheep do not like to drink water that's dirty. Um, another sign of a normal, healthy animal, like I said, the picture of this kid running and jumping. Um, lambs and kids love to play. And, you know, and that's kind of like what keeps us um, enjoying uh, small ruminant production is that they are kind of fun to watch in the spring of the year when it, you know winter time kind of they have to stay up and everything like that and once we get a couple of nice days like we've had in the past um they want to get out and run and play the other thing, thing that's really important and a lot of people don't realize this is that when you go and get them up in the morning first thing they're going to do is stretch especially lambs and kids if a kid or a lamb when you kind of nudge them and they get up and they just stand there something's wrong. If they get up and stretch, they're okay. They'll be all right. Um, the other thing that's really nice about sheep and goats is that when you get them up, they almost always urinate and defecate. So that's the best time to watch watch for urinary calculi in, in our bucks and our, uh, in our weathers. Um, if they are depressed, if there's something that you don't, you know, something's kind of off with them, take their temperature. Get used to taking a rectal temperature. Normal is 101 to 103. Um, if they're depressed and off feed and they've got a normal temperature, it's almost always a metabolic issue. issue. If the temperature is above 103, um, then chances are it's either viral or bacterial infection. Now, the one thing that can be different is if it's a 90 degree day, 90% humidity, and it just took you 30 minutes to catch that animal, guarantee you they're going to have 104, 105 temperature. Let them calm down for a little bit and then, and, and then take that temperature. Super important. So this is a classic picture of a stretching lamb. He just got up. He's trying to get it, probably going to try to get his mom up so he can nurse a little bit. But that is a classic good picture of a normal, healthy lamb. So what is the major poor performance, not only in sheep? In this talk here, I'm going to try to primarily talk about sheep, but you can substitute goat, 
small ruminants, sheep and goat, you know, are, are pretty much the same when we're talking about diseases, et cetera, like that. Um, they don't function the same. Um, they have different metabolic uh, performance issues, but, you know, as far as nutrition and, um, and the diseases that affect them, pretty much the same thing. So the major cause of poor performance in sheep and adult sheep, it's parasites. And it's usually the hot complex, Hamacus ostertagium trichostrongulus. In lambs and kids, it's coccidiosis until they're about three or four months old. And then it can be uh, intestinal parasites. But another reason is poor nutrition. You know, you, you can't graze a pasture till it's nubs and and expect these animals to perform. We've got to do a better job of managing our pastures and keeping that grass four inches or higher to control parasites. And also to to it it really does help with performance. Uh poor genetics costs just as much to feed a sorry one as it does a good one. Remember that. And then of course bad management. So let's talk a little bit about parasites. Um, obviously we all know that it's extremely important in small ruminants. We've all lost one or two or maybe more to parasitism and, and they literally can be, have diarrhea and linger for weeks with parasites, or you can go out there and see a goat that, or a sheep that was perfectly normal yesterday and dead the next day. Um, a lot of them are pretty good at hiding it. Um, but the biggest indicator of a heavy load of homonchus is looking at that third eyelid, doing the Fama Cha technique, pulling that third eyelid down like you see on this goat uh, pick, oh, goat eye down here. Of course, that on a Fama Cha scale is a five. That's the one where you put the skull and crossbones on its head and pray that you can pull them out. You don't want it to get to that point. Um, if they're pale pink, they need to be dewormed. Um, but you know, and, and the other thing is the bottle jaw as shown in the sheep on the left. If you, the bottle jaw, you know, is a collection of fluid underneath the jaw and it's due to anemia, real severe anemia. And the body is trying to equilibrate, um, the, the, you know, the, the veins are just water. And, and it's trying to keep that animal alive and keep blood going to the internal organs. And a lot of times they have, it, water has to come out of the veins. Well, it's got to go somewhere and it'll go to the ventral aspect of the body. You can actually see uh, a ventral edema sometimes, but it, they, they would have to be pretty severe. Most of the time we see bottle jaw. And why is that? Because when they're grazing, their, their, jaw, is, their, their jaw is the lowest point. Um, and that's why we see a lot of bottle jaw, uh, when they're severely anemic. These are the common internal parasites of small ruminants. And if you guys have any questions during the talk, I'll try, I'll try to kind of monitor the chat. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. We got all night to do this. I'm not going to talk all night. My voice will not like me if I do that, but, um, but, uh, you know, definitely ask me while we're on the top, uh, on the subject. OK, so um, internal parasites, a hot complex. This is the number one killer of our small ruminants. Hamonchus, which is uh, the barber pole worm, Ostertasia and Trichostrongulus. Those three worms look on a fecal exam like the same egg. They're called strongyle eggs. And when you do a fecal examination, all you can say is it's HOT complex. You can't say, you cannot identify whether they're homonchus, ostertagia, or trichostrongulus. But it really doesn't matter because if there's a lot of them, they're causing issues. And then we also have tapeworms, which don't really cause a major problem. We do have lungworms, which can cause a lot of coughing as well as pneumonia. And then coccidia is, is a really biggie. Um, with the uh, internal parasites. This is the general life cycle of our nematodes or the hot complex. The 
adult and or no, I'm not gonna say adult. When the, we don't generally see parasite issues in the wintertime, um, we did see a really kind of abnormal pattern last year because it was warm. It was warm until no uh, middle of November. And so the parasites and it but it was really, really dry in late July, August, September, and then it finally started deciding to rain after the growing season was over with. But anyways, so when it was dry, the these worms are smart. They they hibernate um and they go into you know into a hibernation pattern where they don't, you know, they, they know that if they shed out eggs, those eggs are gonna die if it's hot and dry. Whereas if it if you get a little bit of a rain, all of a sudden you'll see these animals just come down with real severe parasite issues. And and this happened like in October this year. Generally it happens the end of August, first of September, after a heavy rain, first part of August. Um, but that was kind of a unique pattern um that we saw this past fall. So um, unfortunately in Kentucky, you know, 90 degrees, 90% humidity, that humidity is what these, uh, nematodes love to, uh, for the life cycle. The, the eggs are passed in the feces and then the first and second larval stage develops in the fecal pellet. Um, after that, the L3 develops and it's the one that climbs onto the grass blades. And, and it usually has to be in a water droplet in order to survive. But that water droplet droplet can be extremely small. Um, an animal walks, comes along and consumes that blade of grass with the L3 in it. Once the third larva is in the host, then it develops into the L4 and L5 within the abomasum homolcus develops within the abomasum of the host. It also could develop in the room. Um, and then the adult will emerge, attaches to the abomasal lining in the case of homolcus. The homolcus attaches to the abomasal lining and starts doing her job of being a egg factory. And she can lay some eggs, let me tell you. She can lay at least 5,000 eggs a day. And the barber boy is nothing but a blood sucking egg producing factory. And just, you know, one, one adult can lay 5,000 eggs. You can imagine when there's about a hundred of them in that abomasum, what's happening. This is the life cycle of Limeria, which is coccidiosis. I've got a kitty cat that's wanting to help me do this presentation. Um, this is a lamb, probably about four or five months old that you can see on its uh, fecal staining that it's got it's been having some diarrhea for quite a while. And this is what you generally see with coccidiosis. If you were to fill that lamb, um, it would it would not have any uh, meat on it. it. It would be very thin. It might have a slight cough, a dry hacking cough. Um, a lot of times we see prolapses in lambs that that you know that have real severe coccidia because they're coughing and when they cough they tend to prolapse their rectum but that that's a really good indicator of coccidiosis just poor performance you the coccidiosis can kill lambs uh, i know a lot of people that know that um but generally uh, the biggest concern of coccidiosis is it robs us of performance and you know when you have a lamb that should be 60 or 70 pounds at four or five months of age and it's only 30 there's something wrong so this is the life cycle kind of similar to the nematode except there's not a larva um, the coccidia is a protozoa and it undergoes it does shed eggs in the feces the eggs undergo what they call sporogamy, sporogony, and it the oh the egg uh, divides in within a cell, and then it it's considered a sporulated oocyst, 
And then that's what the sheep comes along and eats that. Now, they don't necessarily just have to get infected from grass or, or soil. They can actually get infected with this coccidiosis on wood, feed mangers, just the environment itself is where they, the coccidiosis can, can occur. It's a huge problem. A lot of people don't know they have a problem until they lose a lamb and they take it to the diagnostic lab and they say they're loaded with coccidia. And you're going, wow, I never knew. Um, this little protozoal organism, though, embeds in the intestinal lining. And why it's so, uh, why how it injures the epithelial and the intestinal lining is as it undergoes division and multiplication within the epithelial lining of the intestine, it reaches a point where it ruptures out into the lumen of the intestinal tract. When it ruptures out, it destroys the epithelial lining of the intestinal tract. So this lamb that's in this picture with the fecal soiling that you see, we can treat that lamb, but it's still got two or three weeks of repair to do in the intestinal tract before it can actually get back to doing a good job of absorbing nutrients and digesting nutrients. So, you know, it's not a quick fix, but, you know, if you, you got you, you to gotta control this, uh, the coccidia. So this is some of the treatment options. Um, this is primarily for homonchus in, or the hot complex. The best way that, that I have found to get to in my herd to do to treat for uh, parasites is I do what we call strategic deworming. I deworm the, these animals right before I breed them. They're, they're dewormed. And when I deworm, I use two different compounds. Uh, two anthelmintics or dewormers from two classes. And I prefer the ivermectin, cydectin, or what they we, what we call macrocyclic lactones, and a white dewormer. Now, if, if they're not pregnant, which I'm trying to deworm them before I breed them, the reason why I do that, and it's usually in July and August, is that when they're pregnant, especially in that first trimester, I don't want to have to deworm them and put some chemicals in them. So that's why I go ahead and, and deworm them right before I breed them. And then I wait until they kid. And when they kid, that's the most stressful time of that animal's life cycle in that year is when they kid or lamb. The, the dam is immunosuppressed. The parasites know that. And boy, do they 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 go to they go to town in you know in reproducing and and really do some injury you know so many times I have a producer that will give me a call and say hey I've got a uh, I've got a uh, doe she kitted oh probably three or four weeks ago was doing great her kid looked great. And then all of a sudden she's got real severe diarrhea and her kids, you know, there's, she's not producing any milk. And I ask them, uh, is there a, did you deworm them after they lambed or kitted? And the answer is always, no, I didn't know I need to. Let me tell you, that's the best time to do it. Um, there's a question in the chat and I hope I'm answering these it said many good nematodes. There are good nematodes in the soil. Trust me. And and I'll talk about one that we use to, uh, to as a control method. But the name for the nematodes that harm our sheep is the hot complex. Homolcus ostratagen trichostrongulus. Okay. Um, oh, I'll, I'll have a there's a question. What was the names of the dewormers? You, I'll, I'll have a slide here in a second. Uh, and then when you're weaning lambs, if you kid or lamb out in March, then we've already got grass in March. I kid out primarily in December and January. My kids don't really see grass until March. So about 30 days after the grass has really come up and the animals are starting to graze, that's when you need to deworm them. 
So it, it really depends on when your lambs and kids are born as to when you need to be deworming the youngins. And uh, as always, rotate pastures with animals not susceptible. If you have horses, cattle, bring them in. You know, if you're rotating your pastures, run your goats or sheep in a lot, run cattle or horses behind them. And that seems to really work. The other thing that sometimes helps when you're deworming them is to fast those animals for about 12 to 24 hours prior to deworming. The reason why you fast them is it slows down the gut transit time. And so that dewormer has a little bit more chance of affecting those parasites that are in the abomasal, mason, and upper in upper intestinal tract. If you know they they also talk about uh, not providing you know food or water. If it's summertime, please don't skimp on the water. You can not feed them for 12, 24 hours, but please go ahead and continue with the water. Okay, come on. Okay, that, here's the slide with the anthematics that I use. So the first one is cydectin and ivermectin. Those are the, your macrocyclic lactones. That's in the, in, and those of y'all that use Dectamax, that falls in that same family. Um, and that's one class. And then you have your white dewormers or like fenbendazole, which is Safeguard or Panicure, and then Valbazin. And another one is Synanthic uh, that falls into these white dewormers. Let me tell you, the white dewormers by themselves is useless. Don't go and buy sheet pellets with fenbendazole or Safeguard in them. Don't put Safeguard blocks out for them. It just, you're just wasting your money. It does not work by itself. When you're deworming, please, please, please use two different classes of compounds. They This is totally shown to be effective. And the other dewormer that a lot of people use is levamisole. Um, the, these are nicotinic type dewormers. Levamisole is an old, old dewormer. And we had pretty much stopped using it until we started getting these herds that had real severe uh, parasite resistance and you will see this um, in some of these herds where they deworm them they've dewormed them with everything they've dewormed them real frequently they deworm the whole group instead of those that just need it and and they've developed really really good resistance to all of the dewormers and so um, we've had to go you know use that levamisole Levamisoles and valbazin are the two that you really don't want to try. You want to stay away from when they're pregnant. Levamisole has been used, but I still, it, it's, it can be a little bit hard on them. So a lot of times I don't like to use levamisole, but sometimes we have no choice. You know, we've got a doe or you that's four months pregnant and she's heavily parasitized and sometimes we have to use it. And uh, so, the, but those are your, the, those four there, four classes, there's three classes. Those are the ones to use for the, the hot complexes. Something else that I have kind of in, incorporated into my herd is the copper oxide wire particles. When, that, when they kid, they get a four gram copper oxide bullets. This is not to be used on sheep. Um, you can, there are some cotton or hair sheep flocks in the state that we have diagnosed as copper deficient. And we can utilize those copper oxide wire particles in those sheep to help with uh, parasite resistance. But please do not use copper oxide wire particles on sheep unless your, your flock has been diagnosed with copper uh, deficiency. Because if you use copper oxide, although copper oxide is not highly absorbable, you still can get into a problem with copper toxicity if you have plenty of copper in in your ration. Um, and we'll talk about copper here in a little bit. Coxidia treatments, uh, the old standbys are sulfadimethoxine, 12.5%, and amprolium, which is co-rid. 
those have worked in the past, but we're starting to see a little bit of resistance to those products. And one thing that can, that has been, you know, several people have started using is to treasurel or panasurel. These are um, drugs that are used in horses for EPM. And they have an extremely long withdrawal time. When you administer these products, the withdrawal in meat is about six months. But if you use it in one month old lambs or kids, you're going to have them for about six months until you market them. Um, so sometimes, you know, you can go ahead and use those products, but be, be careful. And those products can only be purchased through your veterinarian. And so it's extremely important that you had a, have a valid veterinary client patient relationship. And, and really on, on these, Finbendazole is really the only dewormer that's approved for use in sheep and goats. Uh, Balbazin is too, is too, but as I stated, those are worthless by themselves. Um, but so it, it, it very important to have that valid VCPR. And when if you need to use the tetrazeril or panazeril, you're going to need that VCPR uh, in order to get it. So keep those in mind. You know, we always talk about internal and forget about the external parasites, but that is a problem too, lice especially. I really like a product called Cleanup 2. It's very safe in my hands. Um, it, it, You know, the dose is real easy to administer. It's three cc's per 100 pounds body weight, and you just pour it down their back, and it has a IGR in it, so it's a one-time treatment. When you use some of these other products, you have to come back in three to four weeks later and, and reapply it because you didn't they don't get the larva form. So, but these are some of the other uh these are the drugs, ivermectin injectable, pyrethrins, and organophosphates that you can use to treat uh for lice. One thing that is extremely important is you can't use a pour-on applicator like we do for cattle. Because they have wool and they have hair. And neither one of those, both of those are water repellent. And so if, if now if they're slick haired, like some of these Katahdins are, then you can probably apply it. But I'm not, you know, most goats have a pretty thick hair coat. And if you don't get that product right next to the skin, it will not absorb. So it's super important to maybe use a syringe when you're delivering the product. One of the controls that you really, really need to pay attention to is environment control. If you overcrowd them, you're stressing them, you're, in, you know, they're going to have, number one, coccidiosis is a huge problem when they're overcrowded. And you're going to, you know, you, you just are not, you know, if it's dry lotted and you have food available to them all the time, then that's okay. But if you're trying to overcrowd them in a pasture situation, you're asking for trouble. If you don't manage your pastures pro appropriately, um, you're asking for trouble with parasites. With goats, they always say keep their heads up. They're foragers. That's what they were put on this earth for. Uh, if goats are out there in the woods, you hardly ever see a parasite problem. But if, if they're forced to eat grass and, and they're forced to eat grass to the nubs, number one, that's horrible pasture management. Number two, you know, they're going to have, they're going to be overburdened with parasites. Always try to keep your grass taller than four inches. The, the larva cannot crawl up more than two inches. So if you can keep your grass taller than four inches, you pretty much, and not only do you have really, really good pasture for your animals, you also have an excellent parasite control method. Uh, if you confine your animals, which a lot of people do that, there's nothing wrong with that, but you got to keep it clean. The, you know, that's super important. And once again, always provide clean, fresh water at all times. Some of the alternative forages we have used is Cerisa lespedeza, chicory, bird's foot, trefoil. These, these forages are high in tannins. Tannins have been shown be very, very effective as a natural anthematic. Diatomaceous earth 
you know, I've only seen it work in really, really good managed herds, and I really don't know that they have a parasite problem. <laughs> uh, in the fall of the year, a lot of us have tur turned to offering pumpkins to our goats. Some goats, you know, and sheep love them. Some of them don't, but they say that that's a natural um, anthelmintic. When you look at the controlled studies for natural anthelmintics, none of them are better than 40% at controlling parasites. That's why they're not marketed as anthelmintics. You can add them, but they're not marketed as that. And once again, the copper oxide wire particles. I have not seen these copper oxide wire particles work in animals un under six months of age. So just use them on your older uh, older kids or lambs and, um, and, and adult animals. Once again, do not use in sheep and, unless you have diagnosed, uh, let me get rid of this toolbar. And not, don't use them in sheep unless you have your herd, your herd or flocks been diagnosed as copper deficient. Most wool breeds are very, very sensitive to copper. So be careful and, and don't use it in wool sheep. Um, there's one on the question. If the eyelid is pink or close to white and you had the stool test and it had no worms, what else could it be? Um, there's a, there's a, it, one, one very, very significant thing is if they have diarrhea and they and the fecal exam was negative, I sure would be testing that animal for Yoni's disease. That is a chronic wasting disease, uh, uh, mycobacteria tuberculosis called yonis by everybody else it's seen in in camelids cattle sheep and goats and and that's what i would think now if you just deworm the animal and and there's no worms um and the other thing that's possible is that these worms have been uh there's some worms that you know, they may have already gone in and done the damage and they know that the animal's fixing to die. So they've evacuated the system. <laughs> you know, there's there's nothing more to get. They've they've killed their host and that may be why. But that's un, that's highly unusual. Usually of course you could always have some type of internal hemorrhage going on, but generally you you know if the if the fecal was negative and and they're pale. I don't know what's going on there, but I would I sure would check them for yonis if they've got diarrhea. But yonis doesn't always have to have they don't always have to have diarrhea with yonis. Remember that, okay? Yonis can sometimes just be chronic wasting. They're just inefficient. They they just go to skin and bones, and they can still have normal stool. But if you test them, they're you know, they're positive. So, come on. So, let's, let's talk a little bit about nutrition. Remember that these animals are ruminants. What's a ruminant? Ruminant is an animal with a four-chambered stomach. The biggest part of it, the biggest vat is called the rumen. That is our friend. That rumen can take straw and turn, turn it into nutrients. They are incredible animals. Um, you know, when, when you, you know, they've got certain, you know, there's, there's so many microbes in that rumen. We've got to keep that rumen healthy. They've got to have forage. That's super important with sheep and goats. And, but they can, they can take, you know, just, they, they take stuff that we can't eat. Well, we, some people do. I mean, if you want a high fiber di diet that goes right through you, but they can actually take those high fiber diets and change it into energy, nutrient, you know, amino acids, building blocks. Is They're just simply amazing how they can take that uh, poor quality forage and turn it into something. When you're feeding for production, though, we really, really need to add a little bit to their diet. Um, to increase, you know, increase their demand for performance. 
If they're dairy goats, we really need to add, you know, we've got to give them a highly palatable diet that we can get a lot of energy and a lot of protein so that they can put, you know, produce a lot of milk, just like a dairy cow. If they're, you know, if the if we expect these lambs to be uh, 60, 70 pounds by weaning, their mama's got to milk. And sometimes you need to up the ante to the mamas to get that milk production. Always remember that if you don't keep the rumen healthy and happy, then you got problems. And remember that temperature when the metabolic and when they're depressed and the metabolic and their rectal temperature is normal, it's a metabolic issue. Usually the rumen's not help, happy. So this is a picture of a goat and, and their digestive system. We have the rumen right here, and it's the big bat. And this is this is constantly, you know, when you look in their left lumbar fossa, or right behind their ribs, you'll see this turning, you know, rolling and and you know it it'll it turn tumbles about every two or three times a minute. And what it's doing is it's mixing the, all of the soup, and they regurgitate the food, chew up the bigger particles, swallow it back down, and this is and, and when they do that. They also add a lot of saliva to the the food that we're, they're chewing, and it sends uh, out, the saliva is really high in bicarbonate, and so it keeps the rumen at a proper pH for good microbe health and also for digestion. Once after it leaves the rumen, then it goes into the omasum, where all the water is squeezed out, and then it goes into the true stomach called the abomasum. And you can see the Abel Mason right there. Once that, it's in the Abel Mason, it enters a small intestine. And then it goes into this uh, spiral colon area. This is where the pellets are made. And that's, that's what's unique about sheep and goats over cattle. Is this spiral colon is really, really unique in extracting all the water and forming those pellets. And that, you know, a lot of the, the absorption of the nutrients is number one. The volatile fatty acids a lot of times go out of the rumen into the bloodstream. Um, and those are really important for uh, nu nutrition, you know, energy, absorption. A lot of it's, you know, the abomasum is where most of the digestive juices, acids and stuff like that. Uh, enzymes are added to the ingesta. And then once it enters the small intestine, it's absorbed. The nutrients are absorbed. The small intestine is where the coccidia hits them. And that's why we get real decreased performance when we have a heavy coccidia load. But that small intestine, if it's the epithelium <coughs> is affected, it takes a while for it to mend itself. And that's our, well, that's where most of the nutrients are absorbed. So you can see why that really affects the performance. All right. So food is ingested, enters the rumen. The reticulum is a little area right in front of the rumen. Matter of fact, you know, you always heard of goats would eat anything. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen a goat with hardware disease. Uh, there's been a lot of, of cattle with hardware disease. But when they have hardware disease, they swallowed some metal and it goes like a wire or something like that. And it perforates that reticulum and hits the diaphragm and sometimes will cause an abscess right there. And, and they, you know, it affects their heart, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the old common saying that goats would eat anything, uh, you know, I, I just laugh because I wish my, go my goats obviously didn't read the book because they're very finicky about what they want. But, okay, so the food is mixed with saliva. Microbes, you know, the microbes are in an anaerobic environment down in that rumen. So, and, that, and that's important uh, for these organisms to thrive. But they break down complex carbohydrates like cellulose, you know, that straw, that, you know, those big, thick Johnson grass is a classic example um, cattle have a hard time, you know, they have a hard time digesting really stemmy Johnson grass. Goats love wide, wide, uh, leaf, uh, forages. They love Johnson grass. 
um, but you know, and, and, and horses just pass it right through them. So, but, but some of those, you know, and, and all, goats also eat rose bushes, you know, they love wild rose bushes and briars. And you're thinking how on earth is any of that broken down? This is how. And, but the rumen pH has to stay around six to six and a half. If you feed a high grain diet, that, that may cause acidosis. And then you get die off of the microbes. Uh, it really causes a problem with the health of the rumen. And as I said in the next sentence, you know, about the fermentation process, uh, that, you know, the, the cud, they'll spit up their cud, chew it up a little bit more, mix in some bicarb, swallow it back down, and that helps maintain the pH of the rumen. So, um, and then uh, the mason, you know, squeezes out the liquid, gets those volatile fatty acids that were produced or broken down in the rumen. And then the apple mason, the enzymes and acids are added and a lot more digestion. And then the small intestine is where the absorption of the nutrients occurs. So we have, I mean, there's quite a bit going on. You know, it's really incredible how these animals were made and how everything works. Uh, everything has a job. It's really incredible. So, and, and like I said, when you... When we're talking about stage of production, yes, I have young lambs there, but you can put young kids. We really, you know, creep feeding, a lot of people say, oh, that's too much. That's too expensive. Well, what do you want to do with your lambs? Do you want them to be, you want to sell them at weaning or do you want to keep them for six or seven months? If you're going to keep them for six or seven months after you wean them, then yeah, creep feeding may not be the, what you want to do. If you want to put them on pasture and sell them as a forage-based uh, animals, then you may want to, you know, may cut back on the crate feeding. But if you're wanting to sell weaned animals, then you need to incorporate, you need to set up a crate feeder. Um, this is usually a higher protein, about 16 to 18 percent, a lot of fat in it, and usually has a coccidia stat which can control coccidiosis. Um, if you're feeding wean lambs, you can, you'll probably, you don't have to feed as high of a protein, probably drop it down to a 14 to 16%. Yearlings a lot of times can just be maintained on pasture. You don't want to get them too fat because you, you're going to be breeding them. And obesity is, is, you know, we have a body condition score of one to five. You want to maintain them at about two and a half to three and a half. <clears throat> and that can be done on pasture. And during gestation, that first first and second trimester, uh, a lot of times they, you know, if you've got good pasture, once again, they could probably just, you know, get by with just good pasture. Once you get into that last trimester, though, try to incorporate a little bit of grain into their diet to prevent pregnancy toxemia, and and make sure that they they uh, you know and, and for the viability of the, the lambs and kids when they're born. Once those does and use lamb and kid, please please think about them. You know they a lot of people I, I'll hear a lot of people say oh they're supposed to work off their fat. Well, if you feed the the use and and does. They can put more milk in the bucket. And if they don't, then they need to be cold. If they don't produce milk and you give them like a one to two pounds a day, then they, they're they bad moms. <clears throat> dairy goats, remember, dairy goats are heavy milkers um, and, and you need to feed them accordingly. <clears throat> when feeding the bucks and rams, You may not need to feed them grain, except in maybe in the wintertime. But when you're getting them ready to breed, start at least two to three months before breeding season. But you want to get those bucks and rams up to like a three, uh, definitely somewhere between a three and a four. Because that once breeding season hits, they're going to really, really lose some weight. They're just not going to, they're not going to eat. They're going to be, you know, which we want them to do that. Um, but but make sure they're in really good shape.
shape, and that increases their spermatic output and increases for uh, conception. So don't forget your bucks and rams. So these are the five essential nutrients. You notice what I put as number one, water, water, water. Very important. Protein is the building blocks for the young animals. Energy is what puts milk in the bucket, puts meat on the on the body um, or fat. And then we have minerals and vitamins. This is what uh, lambs and, and kids will drink during the day. It's it's totally dependent on, on the environmental temperature out there. As you probably saw, that when we had these 60, 70 degree days this past couple days, and then it drops down, you know, and then it drops 40 degrees in 24 hours. You know, these these animals going, uh, what's going on here? But anyways, um, I digress. Uh, <coughs> make sure um, that you are, uh, they, they have water available. And, and in the summertime, make sure the water's in the shade. Because sometimes, you know, it, it creates problems if it's in the shade because leaves fall in the water and, you know, once again, the goats don't want to drink it because, oh, there's a leaf in there. But um, but if you want to encourage intake, uh, make sure that, that the water isn't real hot, especially, in the, you know, face it, you know, when we're out working and it's 90 degrees outside, we don't want to grab a bottle that's been sitting out in the sun and drink that water. Um, so uh, something down here, one gallon per four pounds of dry matter consumed. A normal sh adult sheep or goat will easily consume four pounds of dry matter daily. So they need at least one gallon per day. And if you've got dairy goats, they need a quart of water for every pint of milk produced. How many pints are in a gallon? There's two pints in a quart. There's four quarts in a gallon. So there's eight pints. So guess what? She's going to drink eight quarts of water. In other words, two gallons of water for every gallon of milk she produces. That's pretty efficient, actually, if you think about it. But you can't skimp on the water. Copper. I really want to touch base on this copper because we've got to keep this in mind. Um, if you have an animal that dies in your herd, at the very least, grab a piece of tissue from the liver and send it in for a mineral analysis. Copper, selenium, zinc, manganese, all of that is stored in the liver. And that's our best evaluator of our mineral status of our herd or flock. If um if you you know if you if you have animals process, you know, the the you know 60, 70 pound lamb, take us take a sample of liver from one of them and send it to the diagnostic lab and have a mineral analysis done. We could pull blood, but that's not really a good indicator of copper, selenium, you know, zinc, those those essential minerals. So, and there's a lot of things that and are antagonists when we're talking about, you know, copper absorption and metabolism. Molybdenum is the biggest one. And what we get in molybdenum is in the soils. Some of our soils are really high in molybdenum. If they're high in sulfur, then we're going to have a copper deficiency. Sulfur will tie up copper as well as well as zinc and calcium. So, you know, there's a lot of inner balance there. Uh, and so you may think, well, you know, sheep aren't supposed to have copper. They all die of copper toxicity. Not necessarily. It's really important to get, you know, to know what, what your status is. As I said, copper is extremely important for the immune system. And immunity really, really comes into play when we're talking about parasite uh, resistance in these animals. Goats, you generally have a higher requirement for copper. You'll see that in the loose minerals that are provided them. Some of these sheep flocks that we've diagnosed as copper deficient, I tell them to mix the goat mineral and a copper mineral half and half. And, and maybe that won't get, you know, it generally will help with the problem. 
but you don't want to go, please, you know, if you go to a, with a beef mineral, beef minerals are ex extremely high in copper. So that might not be the answer to your prayers uh, for sheep. Selenium, I uh, can't say enough about the effects of selenium when they're deficient. We, we do have a lot of lambs that are deficient in selenium when they're born and kids. I have always, and I will continue to tell everybody, give them a half cc of Bose at birth, even if they don't look like they need it. Uh, I think it really does make a difference. And and I will continue to preach that because it, it has worked in our herd. And I a lot of what I say is stuff that has worked, that I've had to use in my herd. Uh, I mean, I've been raising sheep and goats since early 70s. And a lot of this we didn't have available to us. And so, you know, we, we had to learn a lot uh, back then. But um, but that selenium is a problem. And, and it will cause sudden death in your sheep, your lambs and kids when they reach about three or four months of age and they haven't had access to free choice minerals with selenium in it then you can you can have a sudden death and it's a cardiac issue and uh but and selenium is just like copper really really important for immune system and you know the about the only time i do injectable selenium is when i have uh kids and lambs i don't gen i keep a free choice mineral out for the adult animals make sure they always have access to it and make sure that it's clean. There's not manure in it. It's not water caked. But you don't want to continue to add uh, any injectable selenium. So this is just to touch base on creek feeding. This this is a really cool creek feeding setup up here. Um, let me see if I can move this. I hope this is showing up on y'all's thing. Um, but, the, you know, the kids and lambs can go in here, but the adults cannot. Every once in a while you get a, a renegade that'll try to jump this or something like that. And every once in a while you get a goat or sheep that can squeeze through there. So you have to kind of be careful. Uh, but, you know, the advantages of creep feeding is it produces a higher, you know, healthier animal you know, when you're ready to market them. So, uh, and, and if you use a coccidiostat in your crate feeder, it really, really helps with coccidiosis. And, and also at weaning time, if those animals have been creep fed, it's super easy to transition them from mama's milk to uh, grain. They already know how to eat grain. So it's super important. Uh, the only, you know, only significant disadvantage is the cost. You know, grain's expensive. So, you know, and if you've got good grass, it's it's hard to justify the cost of grain when you want them out there eating that grass. There is a market for grass-fed lamb, grass-fed goat, and, and organic herds. So um, keep that in mind. Come on. So. Remember body condition score. I love this picture of that lamb. That's a that's a real pretty lamb. Um, but if the if the U is uh, lambs in and her body condition score is one and a half to two, she's she's fighting an uphill battle. You know, there's no way she can produce enough milk for those lambs. The lambs are going to be born weak. Um, a lot of the lambs will die. And there's a this certain thing called nutrigenomics which is prenatal programming. They're, they're showing there's enough research out there that says if we don't feed, you know, if we don't maintain the body condition of these, the the pregnant ewes and does in that first and second trimester of pregnancy, if they're not at two and a half to three and a half and getting proper nutrition, then that's when the muscle cells are laid down on these lambs and kids. <clears throat> and, and it affects their performance from, you know, for a long, long time. So please try to maintain a body condition score of two and a half to three and a half. In the wintertime, 
I, I didn't really have a good place to put this, but in the wintertime, you can get your hay analyzed for $10. And it will tell you, you know, what hay do I need to save for them? You know, what's the better hay when they lamb and kid that I that is going to, you know, be better for these animals? Which hay do I need to feed first in that first and second trimester of pregnancy when they don't need, a high, they're not, their energy demand isn't that great? Uh, please do that. Um, Kim Field is our hay person at KDA, and, and um, she does a really, really good job of the hay analysis. All you, you know, it's real simple to do. You can contact your extension agency. And, you know, the only, the only thing that's important is how you take your samples. You want to do a core sampler and, and make sure that you take numerous samples from several bales. But that core sampler will give you a good representative of your hay. So, but all, all your extension offices should be able to help you with that. <clears throat> so nutritional parasitism. If you feed an animal good enough, a lot of times you don't have problems with parasites. So if you don't feed an animal good enough, their immune system is compromised. And like I said earlier in this talk, the immune system is so important for controlling parasites. And, and so tr please, please, please try to, you know, provide these animals uh, with the adequate amounts of their essential nutrients, keeping that immune system in excellent shape, and it really, really will help. Uh, they The animals can actually, you know, parasites were put on this earth to have a symbiotic relationship with their host. Symbiotic does not mean kill. It means that they thrive and the animal thrives. Um, unfortunately, the parasites didn't read the book. And so they really, really do, you know, unfortunately, really do damage to their host. But if you, if we can really provide good nutrition for to our ewes and does, then we should be able to stay ahead of the ball game. <clears throat> Come on, doesn't want to advance a lot of times. Okay, I talked at the very very first of the talk. I said genetics was a factor. It costs just as much to feed and maintain a poor performing ewe or doe as it does a good one. Remember that one sentence, okay? It really, really does cost just as much. Now, you can take a really good ewe and doe and really screw her up if you don't feed her properly but and mess up her genetic potential. But if you get, if you start with crap, you know, it's really, really hard to, to uh, get good stuff out of poor genetics. And even though that animal might cost you a little bit more, if that animal has genetic potential, much, much, uh, you know, it's so important. Records, records, records. Keep records on your, you know, try to shoot for two lambs, two kids per animal. It's, you know, don't buy a ram or a buck that was a single. They might, they probably are going to look like the best animal out there because their mamas only had to raise one. But you really want to find, uh, you know, always try to select for a ram or a buck that's out of a twin. Sometimes we don't want to shoot for triplets, but definitely not a single. Milk production. You know, if, if you have... You know, at when you go to wean and you've got, you know, weaning weights and you take that bottom 20%, find out who their mamas were. If she raised triplets, then maybe that's, you know, the total combined weight. You may want to look at that. But if she raised a single and it was in the bottom 20% of weights, then there's something wrong. She needs to be cold. She didn't produce enough milk. So... Always look at look at records and get rid of those. Let them take a trailer ride. Super important to get rid of the genetics. In management, please, please, please prevent overcrowding. Try to provide shelter. Shelter doesn't have to be a huge, big barn. It can be a lean-to lean to block the wind in the wintertime 
in, and then it could be a tobacco wagon to keep the rain off of them. And, and sometimes we just put, you know, in the summertime, they can just go into the wood. If they have woods, they can get, you know, with the leaves, they can get out of the rain with that. And then, of course, control paras parasitism. The top, the top one, prevent overcrowding, will control parasitism. And then always, always, always provide access to clean water at all times and nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. So just want to touch briefly on vaccinations. Clostridium perfringens type C and D. You know, what, one thing about sheep and small ruminant medicine is that we don't have to vaccinate for very much. There's a lot of vaccines here, but the only ones that you have to use is clostridium perfringens type C and D and tetanus. Our small ruminants are extremely susceptible to those two diseases. And it's one shot. And it costs maybe 40, 50 cents. One shot. And then you give a booster in three to four weeks. And then a yearly booster after that. Pretty simple. You don't if you, you don't have to vaccinate against sore mouth. My, of course, if you don't have sore mouth on your place, please don't vaccinate. This is a live vaccine. Uh, pneumonia, I use Enforce 3, which is a intranasal uh, uh, vaccine, and it's, it's a cattle vaccine, and you only give them one cc of the Enforce 3. There is a pneumonia vaccine from Colorado Serum that you can utilize, but, you know, I, I just, I've used Enforce 3 for numerous years, seems to always work for me. If you have a problem with abscesses in your herd, really, really consult with your veterinarian as far as control. But, you know, the best thing to do is, number one, don't get it in your herd. But once once you have abscesses in there, you really need to vaccinate. None of the vaccines are 100% effective. There is no approved vaccine for use in goats. We have to use an autogenous vaccine uh, in goats. But there is one for sheep called Caseback that works pretty good in sheep. But remember, you still have to treat those abscesses. If you have an animal with an abscess, put it up before it pops, what they call pop, and and, and drain the abscess, lance, lance it, drain it, clean it, keep that animal isolated in a pen by itself that can be cleaned after it heals up, and make sure that the, uh, may, you know, and, and but you have to do control uh, of abscesses along with the vaccine. If you don't think the vaccine is going to totally uh, get rid of your abscess problem, you still have to manage it. The like I said, the best way to keep uh, to treat abscesses is never bring it in. Just want to touch base on scrapie tags. Remember that you have to have uh, you're, you have to have scrapie tags applied to these sheep and goats before you take them to a livestock market. Uh, super important, super easy to get. If you've never gotten scrapie tags, uh, all you have to do is get a premise ID and call USDA. The number's right there. And they, if you're a new producer, you get a hundred free tags. And they're sheer, these sheer well tags, I really like those Shearwell tags. They they they're really easy to apply, uh, but definitely, you know, if, and don't wait till a week before you want to uh, sell your animals and think you're going to get scrapie tags that quick. It's it's a long it, it's about a six week process. So when you start lambing is when if you don't have scrapie tags, when you start lambing, that's when you need to be uh, ordering them. Okay. And just to finish up, uh, sheep and goat, you know, there is a small room at profit school, as you guys probably already know that. And we've also put together a small room at quality assurance program. If you want CAPE funds, we've uh, the small room at quality assurance program. It's free. Uh, you just have to go to the sheep and goat development office and click on it, take it. And there's a simple test at the end of it. And, and then you can get your CAPE funds. So um, just check out those two pro these those two uh, programs, you know, in it, at, through it's through Kentucky Sheep and Goat Development Office, and we've also uh, put together a master small ruminant profit school, which is more uh, information 
you know, it goes into more depth with some of the things with small room in a production. So at that point, I am through with the presentation and will welcome any questions that any of y'all may have. You know, just feel free to ask me. Okay. I think there was one here um, earlier. Let me find it here. How contagious are the parasites? You may have answered that and I just missed it. Okay, so the con contagious is really a matter of your environment. Um, if you overgraze, highly contagious. If you m maintain your pastures really well, um, then in and do rotational grazing and really pay attention to forages, then probably not. Uh, if you're in a dry lot situation, you probably don't have a problem with parasites. It, as long as those animals are dewormed before they're put into the dry lot. Um, but from animal, to, you know, with the hot complex, the Hamonchus ostratagia and Trichostrongulus, those almost always require um, the animal ingesting the third larva to get infected. And, but once they're infected, they have adults in them. And if you don't deworm them, then they, they cause a problem. When you talk about coccidiosis, coccidiosis can be contagious just in the environment. And so it's super important to do fecals because a, a three to four month old kid, maybe April or May, that has scars, how do you know that it's intestinal parasites? or it's coccidia. Only way you can definitively diagnose what it is is by doing a fecal exam. So please, please, please. You know, I get those questions all the time. I've got a group of lambs and they've got scars really, really bad. And I've dewormed them with everything and we cannot get these scars to stop. And I said, what about coccidia? And they go, what's that? <laughs> common, common, common. So um, remember that the routine dewormers do not even touch coccidiosis. You have it, it, remember it's a protozoa, so it has to be treated with antibiotics. So, let's see if we got more questions. Ah, uh, foot hoof and foot care assessment. You know the best way to recommendation for foot foot care is to keep them trimmed. <laughs> no. Um, once again, with sheep, you don't, I mean, if you have, you can keep foot rot out of your flocks by never bringing it in and having good confirmation. If you, if you have, if you can try to cull any animal that you have to constantly treat um, for lameness, then generally that will, um, you can generally, uh, you know, work towards having a foot free, um, uh, you know, that you don't have to trim feet, et cetera, et cetera. You know, building a place that they can walk, that they have to walk on rough ground instead of just soft pasture, you know, having a, having a rock pile that they like to walk on and, and, and lay on. That's super important for hoof care. But if you have to treat animals all the time for foot rot, then you 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 need to try to think about number one bringing in a good buck that is, has good fe good feet on them good structure and not bringing in in you know additional foot rot problems. There are certain breeds as we all know you know Kikos Spanish in the goat world are excellent about not having you know any foot problems. Katahdins are supposed to not, you know, be, but I've seen Katahdins with foot rot too. But, you know, they've that interdigital dermatitis has been introduced. If you have interdigital, interdigital dermatitis, then you probably need to use foot baths. Or if you only have one or two, get rid of them. You know, there's no sense in keeping them around. So let's see here. Oh, good question. Can sheep get uh, coccidia from chicken and rabbits? That is such a super good question because coccidia are species specific. So the coccidia that happens in chickens and rabbits 
does not infect sheep and goats. A lot of people say my animals got sick from the, my rabbits and stuff like that. Nope, they didn't. Um, so they can they they cannot get coccidia from them. Good to have their pasture half field and half woods. <clears throat> if you can rotate them, that would be great because the pasture, the woods will provide protection, and especially with goats. Goats love to forage, and so the woods are really important to provide that forage. So, sheep, no, they don't need they 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 will be fine with grass. But the woods provides shelter um, in the heat of the day. They can go up into the woods and chill out uh, and then come back out. You know, if you ever watch deer, when do you see deer out? You never see them out in the middle of the day. They stay up in the woods during the during the day and then they come out. They're smart. Um, so, yeah, half, half field and half woods is, is excellent. So there is a question about the copper pills. Uh, how often do you give copper pills to goats? Never more frequently than every six months. Um, those copper oxide boluses um, should never be administered. Uh, and, and I only administer it at kidding. And then right before breeding, I, eat, I like the multi-men product. Uh, it has copper, zinc, and selenium. And I use that in my does at breed right before breeding to help with conception um and and that's that's why i don't do the copper now if you want to do copper boluses you know at kidding and then right before breeding i could see i could see doing that but don't give a multi-man in addition to a copper bolus because then you got copper problems um and is cwd in deer populations a problem with corn baiting it most certainly is um we fortunately in Kentucky, there's only been one deer diagnosed with CWD, and there was this past hunt season, and it was out in western Kentucky. But in the in the states that have a huge problem with CWD, they have outlawed um, feeding stations, and because when in areas where deer congregate, they can pass the prions uh, that cause CWD. The fortunate thing about it. CWD stays in deer. It's not been shown to infect any other species. Which is good. I hope it stays that way. But stay tuned. <laughs> so, corn baiting is not good. You know, a lot of times, you know, they don't... I, I think baiting is illegal. I, I'm not a hunter, but I think it's illegal to bait. Um... And there's reasons for that. And, and it's because they don't want, you know, it's just like with the high path avian influenza, we encourage people not to feed deer, uh, be, feed birds in a bird feeder. Why? Because they bring, you know, they all congregate at the bird feeder. And if one of them shows up with AI, it's so highly contagious, they could easily give it to all their friends. So, but, Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> my voice is just, I'm fine. I just, I have not gotten my voice back yet. So one of these, it, it, hopefully it'll come back and and I, I think I destroyed my vocal cords by coughing. <laughs> but it'll be fine. All right. That looks like it was the last question. Um, does anyone else have any last minute questions? You're welcome to come off of mute to ask Dr. Beth as well. Oh, that's good. Thanks. So, says that uh, they still allow baiting in Kentucky, but the decrease the time they are able to bait. So, I know they do it. You know, some they they will not allow you to bait. My my son in law is a hunter, and he he turkey hunts, and and I know that you can't during turkey season you can't, but you can put it out there up to the season. <laughs> is what he says. So if you guys have any questions, um, you know, you, you've got my contact information. 
um, and April can get it for you. And you can certainly give me a call. I'm I'm mobiling today. I put 300 miles on my car, and I thought today would never end. <laughs> and I still got to go to Louisville tonight to for the Beef Expo. But that my cell phone, I, I was on my cell phone pretty much all day. So, <laughs> but you know, all you know, never hesitate to give me a call. I much prefer to. Um, try to prevent these diseases and make y'all some money versus treat. So, and the email's great too. So, all right. All right. Well, we greatly appreciate you so much for being on with us this evening. I know it's a very busy time of year for everyone and especially you. Yeah. So we greatly appreciate you. And I know it was a wealth of knowledge for not only myself, but everybody on tonight, but we thank you so much. And um, my dog is starting to squeak a toy and start to get rowdy. So. <laughs> Say, pay attention to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thank you again so much. Hopefully your voice gets better. And you feel oh, better. it'll be fine. Yeah, okay. Yep. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you everybody all. for being on. Thank you all so much. We'll catch you all later.